Okay, we are about to be started here. Um, if there are people in the back, please come sit down right away. There are some more seats available. Good morning. Welcome to the Martha's Vineyard Book Festival. Thank you for coming and thank you for supporting this wonderful book festival. Um, the, the festival is free, but of course we appreciate tremendously any support that anybody would like to, uh, to provide. Um, food is available all around the grounds. The authors will take questions from the audience. They will reserve time for that. Um, the authors will be signing books following this session. Um, and the books are available for sale in the book signing tent. The next session after this will be back in the tent. So we are alternating sessions. And so um, we hope that when this session is over, you'll move quickly to the next session uh, back in the, in the Menemsha tent. I'd like to introduce the moderator of this panel, Elizabeth Benedict. Elizabeth Benedict's five novels include the bestseller Almost and the National Book Award finalist Slow Dancing. She's the author of The Joy of Writing Sex, widely used in creative writing programs. The three anthologies that she edited included New York Times bestseller, What My Mother Gave Me, 31 Women on the Gifts That Mattered Most, and Mentors, Muses, and Monsters, 30 Writers on the People Who Changed Their Lives. Three personal essays were selected by Best American Essays as notable essays. She runs the college essay consulting company, Don't Sweat the Essay, Inc. She will be introducing the authors. Please join me in welcoming Elizabeth Benedict and our authors. Thank you very much. Um, I, I'm lucky enough to be here today with two friends um, on the panel and maybe some potential friends. Um, can, okay, I'm lucky enough to be here today with two friends on the panel and maybe some potential friends and a few friends in the audience and some family. Um, I want to first begin by introducing our wonderful authors. To my left is Stephen McCauley, who has written nine novels, including The Object of My Affection, True Enough, <laughs> Alternatives to Sex. Um, and, and many of his books have been national bestsellers, and three have been made into feature films. His novel, My Ex-Life, no My Ex was named a Best Book of the Year by NPR and Shelf Awareness. Stephen was named a Chevalier of the Order of the Arts and Letters by the French Ministry of Culture. He is the co-director of creative writing at Brandeis. Uh, to Steve's left is Sigrid Nunez, who wrote The Friend. Thank you. Sigrid's seven novels include A Feather on the Breath of God, The Last of Her Kind, and Salvation City. She is also the author of Sempre Susan, a memoir of Susan Sontag. She's the recipient of the 2018 National Book Award for the New York Times best-selling novel, The Friend. Uh, the Friend is on, the same, uh, on some dozen best of the year book lists. She received the Whiting Writers Award, the Rome Prize, and a Berlin Prize. She's currently the writer in residence at Boston University. I will be interviewing her tomorrow. Um, Richard Russo is the Pulitzer Prize winning author of eight novels, including Empire Falls, Straight Man, Mohawk, and, and that old Cape Magic, two collections of stories. He was awarded the Pulitzer Prize, uh, and the book was made, his book was made into the award-winning HBO miniseries. Uh, Nobody's Fool was adapted for a film. Richard also received the Indie Champion Award by the American Booksellers Association and France's Grand Prix de Littérature Américaine. <laughs> Gary Steingard was born in Leningrad, and he is the author of Super Sad True Love Story, Absurdistan, which was chosen as one of the 10 best books of the year by the New York Times and Time Magazine, and the Russian Debutante's Handbook. His memoir, Little Failure, was a National Book Critics Circle Award finalist and one of the best books of the year by more than 45 publications. 
I would venture to say that some of these people have friends and that some of your friendships inspired um, the books you've written. I just want to talk about friendship. Um, the nuclear family is so 20th century. And here we are two decades into the 21st century. And in place of fathers who know best and moms who stay home and bake cookies and take care of 2.3 children, we have families of every description, every gender or none, and communities of friends who have taken the place of families that we've lost, been shut out of, or reimagined. Unlike the archetypal family, friendships are protean, adaptable, unpredictable, impermanent, and absolutely essential. Whether we surround ourselves with old friends, new friends, casual friends, best friends, school friends, friends with benefits, Facebook friends, furry friends, and even sometimes imaginary friends. In these four very different novels about the way we live now, some friendships are naturally occurring events, others are planned strategic friendships, others drive by connections hatched on Greyhound buses, and one is an unexpected attachment to a 180 pound Great Dane. Um, though friendships play different roles in each of your books, I wanted to start by asking each of the writers how important the idea of friendship was when you started writing these books, or whether that idea emerged as you wrote, and maybe, if you can, how it changed over time. But just that idea of friendship, how important was that? And Steve? Um, thanks, Liz, um, and thank you all for coming. And thank you for inviting me, Smolin. Um, for me, that the you know the majority of the, my novel, My Ex Life, was written between uh, in the summer, spring, summer, and fall of 2016. <laughs> and when there was something going on, I don't know, in the zeitgeist that was a little disturbing to me. And um, as the kind of political rhetoric and the even private discussions about the election um, became more and more um, intense and vituperative in a way uh, that uh, I found myself wanting to write more and more about people who were taking care of each other mm -hmm. and perhaps in a sentimental way um, without any motivation for, of, you know, um, benefits uh, in, of the erotic sense mm -hmm. in return. And uh, so I, I think as, as uh, the more I wrote about the book and the more um, intense the discussion became uh, publicly, uh, the more the sense of friendship became important to me for my characters. I just wanted to retreat into this world where people were taking care of each other because they, they liked each other and wanted the best for each other. Right, so friendship is comfort and necessity when the world is too much with us. Right, right. I mean, and also as someone who's sort of socially awkward and has difficulty maintaining friendships, I wanted to create it for, you know, my characters. That, oh, know. yeah, yeah, I've noticed, I've noticed that about Steve over these 40, know, 40 years We've of only friendship. Known each other yeah. 40 years. Yeah. Sigrid. Well, it was quite some time ago that a, a writer and a friend of mine named Brian Kitely, he made a list of things that he thought. Uh, weren't written enough about in fiction. And one of those things was friendship, at least in American fiction. And I, I thought that was true. And then, you know, I would talk about it in uh, classes that I was teaching why that might be. And uh, the answer was that, that somehow people feel that it isn't as, the, the stakes aren't as high. I mean, there are plenty of novels about marriage and family, but with friendship, the stakes aren't as high. Maybe that's the reason. And then I definitely wanted to um, explore the, the, the very intense and special friendship that happens uh, when you're roommates in college. You know, when you're living, you know, often in the same room for the first time in your life, um, maybe, and and how 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 fraught that relationship can be. And also the, um, in particular, I was interested in the in the in the the, the sometimes fraught relationship between. Women and I, I remember Liz. We were at Barnard doing an event, and uh, well, wait. First, uh, when I even the the mem well that made me want to write the novel The Last of Her Kind. So that's where I explore that kind of friendship. When I wrote the the memoir about Susan Sontag, um, a, a friend of mine said part of what that book is about, honor, um, is about how women can't be friends. Mm. I don't know if you remember that. So then when you and I did an event at Barnard for the orientation, we had all the new uh, young Barnard women in the audience. I said that and you said, 
well, I don't know about that. And I said, well, then why are all these women nodding <laughs> in the audience <laughs> when I said that? So that was one thing. And then uh, I, I, I've always loved animals and been very interested in the relationships, the friendships that people have with them, particularly the canine human bond and, and how it'd be, they're such good friends. And they do so much for people as friends. And you discover that people are somewhat guilty about how much they love their dogs and how they feel about them and they hide that. And, and then above all, you know, when they attribute certain things to them and then they, oh, I'm being anthropomorphic, whatever, um, like gratitude. And, <laughs> uh, and then they're particularly guilty about when they mourn them like a like a human. So 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 that was also very interesting to me. Okay, great. Uh, Richard, um, this new novel of mine that just came out a few days ago, um, I can tell you very specifically um, where where it was um, uh, its genesis and the importance of the friendship. Uh, the, the the three main characters have been best friends uh, for most of their lives, um, but that. Friendship is really cemented uh, in the back room of a sorority house where all three um, are slinging hash uh, back in 19, back in the, the late 1960s, early 1970s. And um, um, the, 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 the start of the novel, the novel really gets going at a particular event, which is the first Vietnam War draft lottery in 1969. Um, I was part of that. Um, I'm the same age as all of the characters, the, the three major characters uh, in this novel. Um, and um, I was doing exactly that in 1969, slinging hash in a sorority house, although in a different part of the country. And what I remember most about that particular event was that um, when the evening began and all the hashers were crowded around a tiny black and white TV, grainy with rabbit ears, is that when we came into the room that night, um, we were kind of all one. We were, we were friends, some of us better friends than others, but we were, we were all in the same boat. And yet when the draft numbers started getting mm. read out, that made individuals of all of us. We, we were suddenly people with individual destinies. We weren't our wow. gang anymore. Wow. Um, and so uh, I wanted this book to be about a moment like that. It had hap gen moments like that op often happen to you when you're young and you haven't, you're still figuring out your own, your own identity and you like to think of yourself as one with your friends. Um, but in this case, what happened that night was individual destinies were formed, and then it becomes a question of, all right, what do we do with that? What do you do when one of your friends has a single-digit draft number, number nine? He's going. He's going to Vietnam. The trajectory of his life just changed. What happens if your number is one? I chose 189 because, in this novel because 189 was the last number to be called. If that was your birthday, your number was 189, you didn't know whether you were going or not, so you couldn't really make plans like getting married or going to graduate school or any of the things that you would normally do. And what, do you, and, and what happens to your life if, like me, your number, your draft number is 322 and you, just, and you know you're not going? You're one of, you're, you are one of the blessed, and on this day, you, you are the one thing that you wanted to be, not necessarily um, brilliant, uh, or tall, or charming, or smooth, or intelligent. That day you wanted to be lucky, and that's and that's um, that's what I was that day. And now um, I find myself thinking about that a lot, and and about what friendship means. How do you get that sense? How do you get that sense of friendship back after something like that has divided you and put you and put you into into the kind of individual destiny camp? Gary. Oh, uh, by the way, this is my first time in the vineyard. Love it. 
<laughs> Larsons, people. <laughs> That's a lobster. That's a lobster. Oh, he's wearing a Larsons hat. God bless you. Thank you for your service. Um, so, you know, uh, like many authors, I think I grew up with difficult parents. <laughs> My mom's nickname for me was Little Failure. Uh, sounds a lot better in Russian. Um, <laughs> And so we came to the States in 79 from Leningrad, and I got sentenced to eight years of Hebrew school for a crime I did not commit. <laughs> but there I was anyway. And I didn't speak no English, obviously. Still have trouble with English. Um, and the kids all called me the Red Gerbil because it was the 1980s, the evil empire, Ronald Reagan, all that. Um, I had to pretend that I was actually born in East Berlin. <laughs> and not Leningrad. If you're in a school and you try to convince kids you're actually a German, a Jewish school, you know there's problems. <laughs> so all I wanted was a friend, somebody to talk to with an accent, without an accent, just somebody to talk to. And I think that was really the trajectory of almost my entire life was making friendships. I didn't feel like the family unit I had was somebody I could count on, trust forever. And just figuring out how to make friends is I think the subject of almost every book I've ever written. Uh, for me, the, the way I did it, the way I finally made a friend, was I wrote something. Um, I wrote a satire of the Torah called the Gonorrah, uh, <laughs> in which, you know, <laughs> Exodus became Sexodus. There was a... Sarah was Brooke Shieldowitz. We all tried to convince her he was Jewish. Uh, and the kids loved it. The rabbis hated it, but the kids loved it. And that's how I made my first American friends, because when you write, there's no accent. People can't tell the accent when, you're, when you've written it. And I actually wrote it on an actual scroll. <laughs> I went to great lengths, but that's how I made my first friends. And there's a socially challenged protagonist to Lake Success. His name is Barry Cohen. He's a hedge fund manager. And yeah, so socially challenged and hedge fund manager goes nicely together. And his dream is to make friends wherever he goes because he grew up so socially isolated. Um, his mom died when he was five. His father's a schmuck. Um, so making friends is his highest calling, he feels. Um, and, um, and I think he sees, he also wants to be a writer. He's one of those hedge fund guys that also wants to be a writer. Uh, and I think he sees writing as a way, he sees art as a way to connect himself with people. And that's simply from my own biography, because without art, I would be completely friendless right now. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I'm going to um, read a little section from Gary's book, uh, the, the new book. Um, and I'm going to then ask Gary, uh, get, there's Barry and Gary, I'm getting confused. Uh, when Barry was a kid, he had been super smart. He could program his Commodore 64 to make graphic make a graphic of the USS Enterprise from Star Trek. Um, but he knew that if he wanted to get out of Little Neck, out of his father's tropical basement, he had to make friends. So each day, he'd stand in front of the mirror and practice 10 opening lines that he could say to other boys in the homeroom. And then Barry would try to think of at least 10 responses the boys could give him, and then 10 more responses for each of their responses. It was a bit like programming the, his Commodore. He could store about 10,000 combinations in his head. And um, Gary, I'm just wondering, did you do this? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if, if I, you don't want to talk about it, I understand. You can just pass. But If I said no, would you believe me? <laughs> uh, yes, I did that. I practiced a lot. I, I lost my accent at 14, but I would practice by listening to Neil Diamond records and trying to copy his accents. That is the saddest thing I've ever done. Uh, <laughs> So I'd stand there, I'd say, they come into America, everywhere around the world, they come into America. <laughs> Not bad, right? <laughs> I'm in the, wrong, in the wrong line of work. Uh, and I would do friend moves. I would, I would, you what? You I, do would, I, would, I would also go to the Douglaston Mall and try to write down what kids were saying to one another. So I was like the secret... Like the journalist, which is funny because that's exactly what I do now. So many of my books, I have no imagination. Like um, a lot of this book takes place in the Greyhound, so I went in a Greyhound and just wrote down what everyone else was saying. You know, oh, you want some math? Here's some math. Blah blah blah. But you know, but but so I would sneak up to kids and I would write down, you know, oh, I want the Kung Fu Grip GI Joe. So then I'd go to school and be like, have you heard about the Kung Fu Grip GI Joe? And that's how people, you know, I didn't sound like the weirdo that I was uh, because at home all we did was there was no television. We just read Chekhov all day long. <laughs> and listen to WBUR classical music. So, yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, there's a theme in your book uh, where, where 
we hear about people practicing their friend moves, mm -hmm. right? So that recurs. Mm -hmm. So is that something that you still do? Or, I mean, do you, t or, <laughs> I mean, or, or I, and I guess, you know, there's a two-part question. I mean, uh, if you were talking to a young person, I mean, I, I have a stepdaughter mm -hmm. and she, I took her to an event once and she was very nervous and she didn't know mm -hmm. anyone. She said, I don't know how I'm supposed to talk mm -hmm. to people. So mm -hmm. I gave her a little lesson in how to start a conversation. Mm -hmm. And I was very touched when I left her off oh. and I saw her doing that. I was. That's <laughs> very sweet. <laughs> But, but I wonder, I mean, now, I know you have a, a son. I do, yeah. And so I wonder if, if somebody came to you, like you, you teach, um, mm -hmm. is this, do you give people very practical advice like this? Or <laughs> if you... I don't think I'm qualified to give advice on, <laughs> on friend moves. Um, <laughs> A couple of things have happened. One is uh, the advent of uh, certain pharmaceuticals. Uh, oh, I've thank heard about you, that. Yeah. Ativan. Oh, <laughs> Ativan's amazing. Beta blockers? Oof. Uh. You don't need friends when you have ball. beta blockers, yeah, right? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> pop one of those and you're good at any social, uh, social event. <laughs> Look at me now, right? Yeah. <laughs> I'm scared to death of each of you, and yet... Eh? Eh? Drugs, people, drugs. Uh, the other good thing that happened... I think you've answered the question. <laughs> I think that's, that's pretty much it. Right, right. I can pass out some Ativan at the end. Uh, buy a book, get an Ativan. Um, and the other thing is I went to the Oberlin Institute for Socially Challenged Individuals, um, oh. a school in Ohio where nobody knew how to make friends. <laughs> and we all just stood there with our bongs, you know, just looking kind of scared. And that freed me up. I thought, okay, people can be this socially uh, incompetent, I'm okay. So Good. send your kids to Oberlin Bard, Hampshire, if it's still around. Yeah. Okay. Um, <laughs> thank you. Um, <laughs> thank you. I hope everyone was taking Try notes. Um, Sigrid, uh, Sigrid, Sigrid's book, the, the Friend. So her book is very deliberately about a friend, and we get. Oh, I'm sorry. And we get from from the cover that the friend is a dog. There are other friends in the book, um, and I just wanted to. Um, read uh, just a brief passage um, from the book. Uh, there are a lot of passages that I would like to read, but um, it, one of the things we haven't really touched on is friends, friendship and sex. And the, or, I think Steve mentioned the, erot the word erotic, right? Um, but, Absolutely. yeah, but, but um, the friendship that uh, the character has with the dog um, is a friendship, but it, there are moments when it has a kind of erotic um, uh, element. And I just, can I, I just want to read a very short passage. Um, and the dog is sleeping on her bed. Um, and if Apollo was a toy poodle curled up on a special blanket at the foot of the bed, it would be nothing extraordinary. Why is it different when the dog is the size of a man and stretched out with his head on his pillow? I acknowledge that it is, but let me say this, when you're lying in a bed full of night thoughts, such as why did your friend have to die and how much longer will it be before you lose the roof over your head, having a huge warm body pressed along the length of your spine is an amazing comfort. He knows all the commands. One night after a long bad day, lost cell phone, listless class, failed attempt to get back to writing, Apollo stirs, starts leaving the bed, and I find myself saying, stay. So that, there's, as you say, there's so much going on between people and their dogs, right? We, we talk to dogs, we think they're talking to us. Um, but w were you, I guess I wanna ask you, were you thinking, uh, did, did the erotic or the, the sort of uh, almost erotic elements, did they surprise you when you were writing them or did you, I mean, did you come upon them or were, was it, did you kind of say, oh, do I want to go here or? No, I, I um, um, you know, part of that section, it's because when she, she's not a dog person, she's a cat person and she ends up with this dog because she's, and no one else will take the dog. Um, and the, 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 the wife of the person who, who k killed himself and left this dog, she doesn't want the dog, and she says, I think that you should take it because he would have wanted you to take it. And she said, you won't have any problems. He doesn't, he's big, but he doesn't really need a lot of exercise because he's bred as a guard dog. And he knows all the commands. All you have to do is tell him down, and he'll you know, get off the bed or wherever he is. And, he, you know. and so as soon as she brings him home, he gets on the bed when she tries to get him down, he growls at her. So 
he gets the bed and she sleeps on an air mattress on the floor. Um, and then eventually, she, he lets her get, they're both on the bed. And then that she, you know, the dog is mourning the loss of the dead owner. She is mourning the loss of her friend who committed suicide, who was the original owner of this dog. Um, so they're comforting each other. So I wasn't really thinking of it that much as an erotic thing, but I do feel like I was just thinking about it and how, for whatever reason, there is a difference between a dog sleeping at the foot of the bed on a towel or whatever, a little dog, and this man-sized thing with its head on its own pillow. <laughs> <laughs> and she says, well, I acknowledge that it's different, but I can't really say why. It's just it's the size. Size matters. <laughs> <laughs> so I, you know, and um, and and then you know he does. I guess he wants to go somewhere. I guess he wants to, you know, what get a drink of water or whatever. And she just at that moment she really doesn't want him to go, and she knows that if she says stay, that he'll stay. Um, but so and you know I I, I I am a cat person, but I I, I have I have lived with dogs. I have I have <laughs> I you know I, I have shared households with people who had large dogs, and so it was familiar to me what it was like to to, to you know to have a, a a friendship with an animal that size. Okay, and so you never know with friends, right? What's going to happen? You never know. What's <laughs> you never happen. know. Um, um, which brings me to Steve Macaulay, um, and Steve's book uh, is about a a once married couple, they were married in their 20s, they divorced and then they went their own ways and the man came out as gay um, and moved to San Francisco. The woman got married and lives in a um, uh, little town north of Boston and she has a teenage daughter and she, um, uh, the, the male character is a college essay coach and um, she calls him and says, I need your help for my daughter. And they haven't spoken, I think, in decades. And, they, and this wonderful phone call where there's just this immediate intimacy between them. And they, they kind of know each other's moves. They know each other's vulnerabilities. They can just start right out, right, being friends again. And that's what the story of the book is. And um, Steve sent me something the other day, and I'm just going to put him on the spot. Um, He's, uh, he wrote in one of his novels, you can't sustain a sexual attraction without some flicker of friendship any more than you can sustain a friendship without some flicker of sexual attraction. Did I? Um, and then Steve said, he doesn't know if he still believes that, but, but I, I'm, I'm wondering if you, how you can apply that to your book, to My Ex-Life. I mean, do, these people are obviously no longer married. They're in different sexual... Well, it occurs to me as you were talking about that, that in fact, you know, because Liz has a college essay business uh, that I called you for help uh, when I was writing the novel, just as the character calls her ex-husband, etc. Um, so what's the question about sexual attraction <laughs> and... Um, well... Uh, flicker attraction. Yeah, I do I kind of believe that in a, in a way, and I don't think that it's necessarily that, you know, you can't have a friendship unless you want to go to bed with someone, which obviously doesn't work. But uh, for me, when I look at a lot of close friendships over time, there are many um, of the same components that there are in erotic relationships, that, you know, one person is more dominant in the friendship, uh, one person seems to make the decisions, uh, relent to the other person, and so on. And in that sense, I, I, I think it's true. And I think... For me, as I get older, um, and I, my characters, well, I don't know why, seem to be getting older as well, um, I find that it's a little bit more difficult to write about um, romantic relationships um, because, I don't know, maybe this is something I should you know, rail against, but while one is allowed to have a, a, a sex life um, as one gets older, um, one is not allowed to ever talk about it because nobody wants to hear about that, um, including the people who are engaged in it. Um, and so it's, 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 uh, there's something about writing about friendships which contain a component of that or at least a little ghost of a history of having had a sexual relationship um, that seemed to me more 
uh, compelling, I suppose. So there's a, a little frisson of, of yeah, sexual, uh, a vestige of sexual interest. There's maybe. a whole history of it. Yeah. And, yeah. and they look at each other and they know so much about each other as a result of their history of having mm -hmm. been married, and mm -hmm. et cetera. So. Yeah, and, and it's interesting because I was doing all this uh, thinking about these issues, and it, it was a long time before the word intimacy came to my mind. Um, in thinking about friendship, but but there it, it, we and we often think of intimacy as a sexual uh, sort of mm. element, right? But but there's also an intimacy in friendship. It's a different kind. Um, but um, it, 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 the word intimacy in friendship is is I just I, I'm kind of just rolling it around and, and thinking about it. And I, I kind of want to get back to it. But I but I want to ask Richard. Um, I want to read a little quote from Richard's book, new book, Chances Are, and, and this friendship that you describe, I mean, this, this, the, the origin of the book that you talk about, there are three guys who all have these different fates, and then there's a woman who's their friend, and they, they gather uh, one weekend in 1971 in Chilmark, the four of them. So it's a sort of Harry, when Harry met Sally, it's like, can, can women and men be friends without wanting to sleep together? But that's, but, um, and then something happens, there's a big secret that they, they carry for decades. And the, these three friends have a motto, uh, which is um, uh, all, f all for one and one for all. Um, and the quote is, hadn't something whispered to him then that all for one and one for all was just a lie they'd convinced themselves to believe in? Was this how wars happened, the seeds of conflict, large and small, growing in the gap between what people wanted to believe and what they feared must be true? Um, and I, 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 you know, I guess, was it difficult for you to kind of introduce this betrayal into the friendship? Because there is this enormous betrayal that goes on for decades. And it, it has to do with the, the, the woman in, in the story and with the fact that they were all in love with her. And they all were keeping secrets. They were, they were supposed to be best friends who would do anything for the other, but they were all in love with her and they just didn't want the other guys to know. Precisely. Yeah. <laughs> That's, it happens like that, doesn't it? Yeah. Um, I think the challenge um, for this particular story was to make both of those things live in our heads. This, the contradiction of what you were just talking about. Um, to make that live in our heads all at the same time. Is it possible for these three men who have been friends since they were all in the same kind of snooty liberal arts college. Um, one, of the, one of the things that binds them together, of course, is class, because they're all scholarship students. And so they're in, the three of them are in this foreign, this very, very foreign world. Um, and, dis, and despite the fact that, that their, their personalities are very, very different, they're brought into this place where, their friend, where this friendship is forged and it's very powerful and it's on the basis of class. They're not only all in love with the same girl, they're in love with that, what that girl represents because mm. she comes from a different class. Right. So for, for the three of them, it's, it's, really, it's really part of the package. They're in love with her, but they're also in love with Greenwich, Connecticut. Mm -hmm. And they're in love with that, um, that, that world that they don't know and, and would like to know. So what the book kind of asks you to do uh, is entertain the possibility that these three dear friends, and who will be dear friends in 2015, because that's the kind of the span of the novel. We don't get the center of it, but we get those two weekends. It asks you to entertain the possibility that good friends uh, who have a bond of in intimacy, whether it's based on class or, or whatever, once you have this bond of intimacy, can you betray that and still, and still be best friends? Um, and that's, that, was, that was the juggling act there. Was, was to, yeah. was, was to, and like, 
a lot of times when you start a book, you don't know the answer to that. Right. That's right. one of the reasons you're writing it, is to right. find out. Exactly. Um, I would, uh, we'd love to hear from the audience if you have any questions for these shy and retiring, inarticulate <laughs> authors. <clears throat> There's a microphone in the, two microphones. Hi. Hi, come up to the mic, please. Good morning. <laughs> um, so my question for you, you all could is... Could you just come up a little bit? A little closer? Yes. Uh, yeah. Okay. Um, so my question... Thank you. Um, is regarding, you know, when you're developing friendships like that, how do you get to know your characters? I've heard many different strategies people have used from talking to themselves to writing, you know, character studies. So, so character yeah. development. Yeah. Whether it's friendship or anything yeah, else, right? Yeah, or like right? just how you get to know that, that character. Yeah. Uh-huh. Sigrid. Um, well, I think very often when you're writing fiction, at least some of what you're putting into your characters, you're taking from people that you've met okay. in real life or heard about or read about or learned mm -hmm. about. So there's a certain amount of that. But um, I, I tend to think it's probably not such a good idea to... I, 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 I prefer to think about a character's personality rather than to think of a character as a character. Mm -hmm. um, the character has to have some kind of personality to be interesting read, to read about. And I, I feel like you, you get to know the, the character and their personality as you're writing. Um, I, don't, I really don't think there are, are, there, there are such good, good, good uh, plans or, or, or tricks or whatever. It, it is sort of, some, you know, there are these things that you want to leave air for and room for to happen while you're writing without worrying about Am I getting the character developed here? Mm -hmm. You know, it's more like is is it is it is it happening? Uh, is the character interesting? Is this a convincing uh, way that somebody would behave? Someone else? Anybody else? I would say that the, um, to just pick up on what Sigurd is saying about personality, um, and 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 our friendships can come. Our, our understanding of friendships can come from a variety of different and sometimes um, surprising places. In this particular book um, of mine, what I did to develop these characters and their very dis different personalities, I didn't have to go anywhere except into my own, into my own psyche because um, we all have within us, I think, various aspects of, of personalities. One of my characters, Lincoln, represents, he's, he's very conservative. He's, he's conservative politically, he's conservative culturally, um, and he really represents every moment in my own life where I have ever played it safe, and there have been many of those, simply because, like all the characters in this book, they all work without an economic safety net. And so there have been many times in my life where I've done something that was, I, th I thought there was probably a better thing to do, but I was too scared to do it, because other people were going to pay the price okay. um, if I was wrong. My my middle character Teddy is kind of uh, is, is kind of the more the artistic type, and I was able to draw on 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 those creative aspects of my own character. Mm -hmm. But that made them very different. They're both coming from me, but it made those two characters very different. Mm -hmm. And my third character Mickey is an aging rocker, and there are and there are times right now at age 70. I'm ashamed to say it, but there are times right now if the right song comes on the radio, there's nothing I want to do but strap on a Fender guitar. Yeah. <laughs> uh -huh. And and those those three impulses, um, um, and because most of us are incapable of of telling literal truth about anybody for very long, right? They they so that takes care of itself. The character development takes care of itself. It's a question of knowing what they want and what they fear. I would say, uh, for me, what I'm really interested in is self-delusion. Uh, I think I'm a giraffe, but I'm actually an aardvark, that kind of thing, you know? Because we all have different perceptions of who we are than we actually are. And to me, when I can hear a character say something like that, one line can reveal everything. I was working on, there's two characters in Lake Success, Barry, the hedge fund manager, and there's his wife, Seema. And I was trying to get Seema's character just right, and I was interviewing the wife of a hedge fund manager who was lovely, very progressive, went to this great, you know. Uh, and she said at one point, she said, we were talking about, where, I have a little kid, we were talking about where to send him to school. He's five years old. And she said, oh, Gary, you should send him to ethical culture. She said, because it's so diverse. And I said, well, they're all white. <laughs> and she said, no, I mean economically diverse. Some of these kids, their dads aren't even hedge fund managers. <laughs> They're just doctors or lawyers. 
And immediately, as much as I loved her, I thought, okay, now I know you what understand. privilege has done to you. Yeah. And now I know what kind of person you are. And I can do this in a sympathetic way, but now I can write more of you than I could before you had uttered that one line. So you're always sitting there with your phone or your pen, mm -hmm. waiting for that line to happen. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Um, yes. Um, I'd be curious to hear from the panelists your views on the difference between female friendships and male friendships, and particular how the men feel about writing about friendships between women and how Sigurd would feel about writing about friendships between men. I didn't hear the full question. I'm sorry. Could you? <clears throat> um, the difference between friendships between women and friendships between men and how the men feel about writing about women's friendships and how the women feel about writing about male friendships. <laughs> well, it's a big question, but I ha well, how do men feel? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, uh, women good? <laughs> I, haven't, I haven't written about, I, I'm trying to think, I haven't written about male friendship myself, I don't, so I don't know if, what the difference would be, and have you, you've, all, you've written about? I, I've, written a, would, I've written about um, female friendships, and I've written about I guess male friendships, but not as intensively. I, th I, I have to say that I think we're drawn to writing about what we know, right? Yeah, and right. and uh, even if it's not autobiography, uh, we're, we're writing about what we know and in the deepest sense. And uh, so, you know, the re I, I suppose the reason for all this unexpected silence is that, um, <laughs> is that you know, maybe there hasn't been that much... Um, uh, share, you know, writing from the opposite sex in that intensive way. Right. But, but that's just a, a, right. a thought. I've written <laughs> a I, lot about men, uh, men observing women's friendships yeah. with a mixture of envy and uh, horror, in a sense, because the feeling is that, you know, I mean, I don't know, I'm along, I'm along mm -hmm. a lot of men mm -hmm. I know, that, you know, if you tell a woman something that their friendships are so intimate that everybody's going to know it um, in a, what? We'll talk about that. Okay, okay, <laughs> okay. So, but, but, yeah, I mean, I think what you said is true. There's a little bit of a taboo. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I mean, it's a, it's a little bit like writing about a, a, a uh, you know, uh, about living in a country you've never visited. And, and, and I think there is, a, there is a gulf between men and women in all kinds of ways. I, I don't know if we're supposed to say that, but, um, but there is. And obviously it comes through in, in what we decide to, to write. I think what we're talking about here is the challenge of imagination, yeah. right? What what do we what do we or feel? Empathy. Uh, or empathy. Or, or empathy. Yeah. Uh, or interest. I, I, or interest. I, and I think, I think there it's it's not just gender. There there are all kinds of problems of of, of writing uh, about something that you don't have first or even second hand experience of, and um, gender is particularly difficult, of course. And I and I. I don't know. Maybe it's, maybe women feel the same way. Again, I, I have only this just this one body, um, in this one life, so I can't generalize too much. But um, I think that um, one of the things men really, really don't want to get wrong. If you're writing about a female friendship, um, one of the if you if you're a man writing about female friendships, the one thing you don't want anybody to say about you is, boy, this guy just doesn't know a damn thing about women. You know, and, and so as, as we go beyond the borders of our own personal experience, it, it's a challenge. It's part of the job. It's part of what we're supposed to be doing. But, it's, but you, you don't do it lightly. I was just saying, I, I, I was really lucky that in most of my life, most of my friends have been women. Um, and so that really helped in terms of writing about dialogue and relationships. Uh, for this book, actually, there's more men friendships than ever. <laughs> So I had to make, make some man friends, I think, is what they're called. And, and it, it was really hard, because I don't know anything about uh, uh, baseball. <laughs> I, I just learned how to drive a car. I can't talk about car. I realize that men have a very narrow range of things. Uh, so I started collecting watches, which is a man hobby. Um, and I started going to these secret events in Manhattan where men would come and throw their watches down and exchange them and play with each other's watches. And the only way they can talk to each other is about the, through the watches. Like, oh, is that a 950L? Uh, and, and so it's scary. Um, but I'm done now. Yeah, with men. Thank 
Good morning. Thank you all for being here. Um, I have a question for Mr. Steingart. One of your characters in your book, Lake Success, that really stuck with me was the son who has mm -hmm. aut mm -hmm. autism spectrum disorder. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And first, I want to thank you for not only showing, this is a mild spoiler, not only showing that he is successful in mm -hmm. the end, but also mm -hmm. the struggle mm -hmm. that he and his mother went through when, even mm -hmm. with all the resources they had. Mm -hmm. So I guess my question for you and everybody is how do you take someone who is either part of a minority or underrepresented mm -hmm. like someone mm -hmm. who's on the ASD or whatever, mm -hmm. and represent them as best you can in, in your writing. Yeah. Um, well, uh, thank you for your kind words. Uh, autism plays a very large part in Lake Success. Um, so when I was growing up, I think I mentioned my Hebrew school years, and I realized, looking back, at the very few friends I had made, I think a lot of them, again, it's horrible to di retro-diagnose is a real problem with ASD, but I think many of them were on the spectrum. The behaviors were very spectrum-y. And those were the people that were my friends. Yeah. So I loved them with all my heart. You know, they, I was very close to, to them and I had my own sort of challenge in that I didn't speak English and I was a weirdo. But together we had this kind of bond. And growing up I realized that many of my friends, again without diagnosing, are, are close to the spectrum. And then many of my friends have children who are officially on the spectrum. So I've always been surrounded by people from that community. I think the happiest part of this whole process was meeting Temple Grandin, who is the most amazing human being in the world, and we got pretty drunk together. <laughs> she was talking about taking a guitar and smashing it on the table, and I'm like, the spectrum is so wide and complex, and no one, no single person on the spectrum is like anyone else. But I think it's the idea of have having a childhood where I was told, you're different, you're not gonna fit in ever, everything's gonna be twice as difficult for you, especially in communication, making friends, and I think that predisposed me to, to, to having strong feelings about people in that community. And, They've been so wonderful, and and part of this book is going around and meeting people, either care, caregivers or or actually or people themselves on the spectrum. Uh, that's probably been the best thing about publishing this book. Thank you. Um, I think we're going to do one more question, and it's you. <laughs> Thank you all for being here. Um, I had a question about this link between friendship and intimacy, and whether that sort of necessary. I'm sure we've all had different kinds of friendships with different degrees of intimacy. And this is a question um, mainly for uh, Gary. Um, Lake success uh, very seems to operate with this idea of like the form of what a friendship looks like when in fact it's sort of completely one-sided. And like that's the really funny part is like when when Jeff is like, oh, we're not friends um, or uh, or his pastoral story about his girlfriend who, um, and, and it just is not received the way he expects it to be. And, and I guess this is also um, something that I think came up in, um, I'm sorry, Richard, I haven't read Chances Are yet, but I did just finish Trajectory. Um, and in that, you have the short story about the realtor who um, has this totally obnoxious friend of his and his wife. Um, and you get the sense that it's almost a similar situation where, uh, yeah, I'm sorry. Anyway, I just wondered about that. Okay. Do you have a question? No. Do you have a question? Okay. Oh. All right. Um, uh, thank everyone. Thank you to everyone. Thank you to the writers. Um, each of the writers will be interviewed tomorrow, so I'm sure you'll want to go to each of them um, and hear more from them, and of course read their books and buy their books and try to become their friends in the next day. <laughs> They're all available. Thank you. The next event is in the tent, and then come back.